Doug Lamon. Uh, like you said, I'm, I'm from NVIDIA Research. I'm a senior research scientist. Uh, I've been there for about two years. Uh, so being at this conference is a little unexpected. Uh, I was at MIT before that, and I was working on glasses-free 3D displays. So I have this attraction to display technologies that are never quite ready for prime time. Uh, so here I am today. So, so when I got to NVIDIA, you know, some of, of Neil's colleagues and my own uh, said, you know, Doug, 3D displays are great, but they're not really going anywhere. You should be working on head mounts. And this was just before Google Glass and, and uh, Oculus were announced uh, two summers ago. So I, I took them at, at their word, and, and uh, I thank them a lot for putting me on this track. Uh, so like most of us, when we know nothing, we go to Wikipedia, and we try to become an expert, or at least pretend we are one. And so you know, when you're learning about head mounted displays, one of the things that really made me happy is uh, the first guy I ran into, right? When, when you ask Wikipedia who invented head mounts, right, was Ivan, Ivan Sutherland, arguably, in the mid-60s, introduced uh, the first uh, graphics-driven head mount. Does anyone know the name of this head mount? That's good. You know, this, now, I always ask this question, and you know, most audiences, they have no idea. But I learned two things from this, this project. First, uh, in the late 60s, we had way cooler project names. Right? It wasn't just random lowercase letters. It's Sword of Damocles. Right? The reason it was called that is Ivan was using late 60s technology. So you see a head mount on the left. Right? It's suspended by cables and pipes from the ceiling. But the second thing I really learned is if you look on the right, this isn't much bigger and bulkier than head mounts we have today or certainly five years ago. And the thing that really uh, surprised me is notice you can see Ivan's eyes. And he can see you. From the very beginning, head mounted displays were augmented, not just virtual reality. Right? So this is half a century ago, roughly. Right? Where did we get? Well, you know, it's, it's dangerous to say in this community, but I'd say not very far. Right? All of these devices are still small shoeboxes on our head. Yeah, we got embedded processors, we got batteries, we got slightly better optics, but at the end of the day, these things are still small shoeboxes. Right? So are consumers really going to respond to that? Well, consumers may not, but if you look on the top right, soldiers, sure. If my life depends on this, yeah, I'll wear something bulky and heavy, and I'll pay tens of thousands of dollars for it. But the bottom row is what I really care about. right? Why I'm at NVIDIA is consumer electronics. Right? And the bottom row are things that have been marketed in the last 10 years. Yeah, they have 40 degree field of view, may or may not have head tracking, but they're still small shoeboxes. Right? So yes, the mobile phone technologies have come, but what hasn't changed are the laws of physics. So being a researcher, what I really care about is somehow changing the game. How can we make these things not like shoeboxes and more like sunglasses? Right? So those are a lot of bold claims. What have I done? Well, my first year at NVIDIA, I built this head mount. Uh, now it still looks like a small box on your head. It looks like a Wiimote on your head, really. Uh, but the important thing here is, is the optics, right? So I, I tried to change the game about way, the way the optics works. So if you look at this, yeah, it has the same box everyone has, which is the driver electronics. And then it has a pair of displays. And those displays are less than a centimeter thick. And all they are is a bare OLED panel, right? And then the magic element is not so magical. It's just a micro lens array placed directly on top of the OLED. Right? And so if you look at a conventional head mount, look at Oculus Rift, look at any head mount that's been designed in the last 50 years, essentially it's a magnifying lens or a magnifying mirror on top of a screen with some mirrors in the way. Right? And if you want a wide field of view, that means the element needs to be wide, large, which means the focal length needs to be long, which means it's thick, which means it's a shoebox on your head. So the game here is not to build one head mount, but to build hundreds of head mounts per eye. Right? So if I take a small little micro lens, its focal length can be very short, the whole thing can be thin. Uh, so that's the idea in a nutshell. Here's one of my coworkers wearing the prototype. So it's about a centimeter thick. Again, if I was a real electrical engineer, I could get rid of this box. I, I'm not a real electrical engineer, so I still have it. But if it goes away, you know, what you'll have is the normal sort of head-mounted display experience. But keep in mind, this is only a centimeter thick. And with a little more engineering, this could be a few millimeters thick. Right? And there's no temple-mounted projectors, no special holograms. It's just micro lenses and OLEDs. Right? So I think this is something uh, interesting. Now, I am an NVIDIA. Right? I'm not an optics company. And part of the interesting story here is you have to change how you render. Right? Of course, with most head mounts, we have binocular disparity. We need stereo. Right? This is stereo on steroids. We need a light, view, a light field per eye, stereo light fields. So if you're familiar with a Lytro camera, you need two of those video in real time or a virtual equivalent of it. So what I'm showing on the left is the raw image on one of the displays underneath the micro lens. And so each lens is magnifying one small perspective of the scene. And when you look through the microlens array, these hundreds of perspectives coherently shift on your retina. And if you look at, for instance, the headlamp of the car, you see a nice single headlamp. What's interesting is the tail end of the car doesn't quite combine on your retina, so you get focus cues. So this is one of the first head mounts to give you focus and defocus cues. 
All right, so that all sounds interesting. Why would you do this, uh, and what's interesting about it? Well, I think there are four reasons. The, the four reasons this is interesting is it's thin. It's among the thinnest head mount ever built. It's lightweight. Without this box on top, it weighs maybe 25 grams. Uh, and it's immersive, right? If you have a large display, you have a wide field of view. And if you've used the Oculus Rift or anything like it, for virtual reality, right, I don't think there's any point in these 40 degree fields of view, right? I'm looking at this looming monster through this tiny keyhole. It's, it doesn't feel like a looming monster. It feels like I'm looking at a theater stuck on my head, right? So wide field of view is really the whole game in virtual reality. But I think the real reason light fields as a head mount technology is interesting is they're comfortable. And what do I mean by comfort? Well, all stereoscopic displays suffer from uh, some key limitations. So hopefully most of you are aware of this thing known as accommodation convergence conflict, right? Imagine you went to a cinema and you were looking at a stereoscopic screen. You're, you're wearing your Real-D glasses. And the actor walks off of the screen surface towards you, right? Your eyes will turn in their sockets and verge on that actor or character. And as a result, your eyes will try to focus off the screen surface. And as soon as they do that, the entire screen goes blurry. This is known as accommodation convergence conflict. All existing head mounts have this. Uh, and what's interesting is with a light field, you get rid of that. You're approximating the wavefront to each eye, and therefore the eye can focus and perceive correct accommodation cues. And so this leads to a better, less nauseous experience over time. And then as one sort of parlor trick, because you're creating a wavefront, this is one of the few head mounts where you don't need additional optics to correct eyeglasses prescriptions. So if you're nearsighted, farsighted, you have astigmatism, I don't need to sell you any additional optics. This is one size fit all. I just change how I render, right? By distorting the wavefront you're presenting, you can then correct for the eyeglasses prescription. So it's thin, lightweight, and very comfortable. OK, it sounds wonderful. Why isn't NVIDIA selling this, right? I did this two years ago. We could have something on the market by now. Well, how many of you have heard of the Lytro Lightfield camera? Probably everyone in the Bay Area. Well, the real problem with light fields is you get form factor benefits. You get the ability to refocus but you lose a lot of resolution. So in this case, I go from something that has maybe 1,000 pixels across horizontally in each eye down to something like 200. So we lose resolution by about a factor of five or six. Lytro loses by a factor of 10 or more, uh, so it's not quite as bad. So that's one reason. This is a technology that I think is three to five years out when we have OLED panels with sufficient resolution. You can, of course, beat this with brute force. If you're willing to pay for it, you can have 8K OLEDs. But I think the more important story here is to be careful in the microlens selection. Have larger microlens arrays. And finally, understand the calibration. You need to know the user's eyeglasses prescription, so you have to get it somehow. OK, so I uh, only had a few minutes here, so I'm going to skip over the fun math part where I explain all the details of how this actually works. And you can just take it on faith. It's very interesting. It's all in the paper. No one cares about math anyways. So <laughs> really, at my heart, I'm a do-it-yourself guy. And the fun part of this project was building it. And so I built two prototypes, and I have about two and a half minutes to tell you about them. So the first one is building the prototype I wish I could make, right? And so I need to cheat here. You can't buy a four by four centimeter 8K display, but you can make one for a few pennies. What you can do is you can have a piece of film laser exposed, and that piece of film can simulate when backlit arbitrarily high resolution displays. So what I have here is basically an 8K display that's four by four centimeters. Something that Oculus and every other company here would love to have but can't get yet. So I'm already 10 years ahead in the future with a few pennies. And when you look at the film, you have thousands of perspectives per eye, right? Put the micro lens array on top of that. And what you get, and I can show this to you if you run into me on the show floor, but uh, again, for a few dollars, it's a head mounted display that's a degree filled of view and gives you focus and defocus cues. And so here's what it looks like if you get a chance to put it on. Right? So as with all head mounts, you need to enter the eye box, uh, which is a little odd. Uh, it's periodic, so it actually has an infinite eye box, which is another unique feature. And then here you can see uh, a sharp image. Notice the coin sitting on there is completely defocused. And the eye box is around a centimeter by centimeter, which is comparable uh, to many, many head mounts. OK, so that's what we could do in maybe three to five years. What can we do today? Right? And so this is the fun jo job of being a research scientist. This was my first project at NVIDIA, so I didn't want to break the bank. Uh, so what I did is I drove down to Gilroy, and I borrowed Sony's best engineering. I bought a refurbished HMZ T1. How many of you have used the HMZ T1? It's a beautiful head mount. Uh, I was talking to Palmer Lucky. He used to play with these when he was getting started, too. Uh, they're very inexpensive, and they're incredibly well designed. And so what I did is I took the nice, nicely designed device on the left and made a 3D printed prototype on the right. And so if you open an HMZ T1, there's some great teardowns on YouTube. It's very easy. 
It reminds me of being in high school and doing case mods for PCs. But for your $400, what you get is absolutely amazing. You get a push button controller, an OLED, uh, with F uh, an OLED driver board with an FPGA, and a pair of 720p uh, one inch diagonal OLEDs that you can drive using HDMI 1.4a and stereo. I'm not an industrial designer. This is actually the first thing I ever 3D printed. Uh, so you have to bear with me that it's basically a Wiimote on your head. So here the micro lens array is sitting on top of the OLED. Package that back up into a head mount. And there you go. So again, this is using today's technology. It's 720p OLEDs. So the image itself is maybe 150, 200 pixels across and only 40 degree field of view. But you can do that today. Uh, not to beat up on Sony, but this is the optical stack Sony had on the left. Right? So it's a 65 gram magnifying element, has four lenses inside, and then the OLED panel is another half centimeter at the bottom. The entire optical stack here in mine, the lens itself goes from 65 grams down to 0.7 grams. Right? It also costs pennies. Uh, and then the part I can't talk about is the rendering side. And so I actually used ray tracing uh, to generate the light field directly. So again, this is what you would see underneath one of these micro lens arrays. If you cram a camera up against the head mount, or you come by NVIDIA and I can show you the real demo, you'll see something like this. In the latest prototype, the imagery is a little sharper. But again, we're starting with a 720p uh, OLED panel and dropping the resolution to gain the light field ability. Now, you know, I came from MIT. This sort of stuff is fine if you're going to SIGGRAPH. You can show rotating teapots and cows, but I'm at NVIDIA now, right? And so I had to show uh, my boss something a little better. Uh, so John Carmack released Doom 3 uh, a couple summers ago. And so it turns out with just 50 lines of code, you can support stereoscopic light field rendering uh, in almost any game engine. And so you know, in the past, when reporters ask about this technology, they say, oh, you're rendering thousands of views. You're going to need a whole cabinet full of GPUs. No. I'm running this on a standard 660 Ti. It's a couple years old. Uh, and you can run it at 60 hertz, no problem. So the rendering side is not as challenging as you'd guess. Uh, so that's it. Uh, again, it's thin, it's lightweight, and I think the core idea here is this opens the door for head mounts to address a lot of the comfort issues. And I think in virtual reality, the comfort will really matter. Right? It's one thing to use a glanceable display every once in a while, but if you're like me in high school, you're going to play a video game all weekend with your friends the whole day and all night. Right? And so in that case, comfort, accommodation convergence, handling your eyeglasses prescription correctly, I think these things all matter, and so that's why I think it's worth sacrificing resolution to have some of these. So feel free to fire me a tweet if you have questions or run into me in the hall. Thanks again for taking the time. OK, so I, I see some hands uh, going up here. Oh, we have time for one question. So Gregor, I'm going to shoot over here. Uh, what about AR? What about AR? Great question. So this was the big project I did last year. So this year, one of the projects I did was an AR version of this. Uh, we're showing it at SIGGRAPH. Uh, of course, the challenge with this is it has a micro lens array. And if I hold a lens array between me and the world, the lens array will magnify, say, a transparent OLED, but it'll distort the entire world like a diff diffuse piece of paper. And so we haven't gone public with the details of how we did it, but uh, we call this a pen light display AR. And so we'll actually be doing a live demo at SIGGRAPH, and the paper will come out. And, but it is possible to do this as an augmented display as well. Awesome. Thanks and that's joint work with uh, Henry Fuchs and Andrew Mamone at the UNC Chapel Hill. So of course, Henry is a legend. I'm sure most of you know who Henry Fuchs is. And so it was, a, it was really a privilege to work with him on the AR version of this. And that's exactly what Henry said when he saw this. He saw it at SIGGRAPH, and he said, Doug, OK, this is great. How do you do AR? <laughs> awesome. Thanks a lot, Doug. Thanks. And so 